In my search for the truth behind the new wave of Jew hatred and terror attacks in France, my journey of discovery takes me to one of the smaller countries on the European continent, Belgium. Little did I know before I started my research that Belgium had such a big problem with harboring Islamic terrorists that spread their hatred of the Jewish people and Western democracy throughout Europe. European security services have struggled to understand the new threat they face. A decade ago, bombs went off in Madrid and London, and Belgium was largely ignored until now. Belgium has supplied the highest per capita number of fighters to Syria of any European nation, between 350 and 550 out of a total population of 11 million. That includes fewer than half a million Muslims. The most horrific terrorist attack to date in Belgium occurred on the 24th of May 2014, when a lone ISIS terrorist opened fire at the Jewish Museum in Brussels, killing four Jewish people. The people of Belgium have woken up to the realisation of the real danger and threat that lies within their borders. There are a few brave and courageous individuals who are speaking out to warn their fellow citizens and the rest of Europe of this imminent danger. It was only over 70 years ago that the world witnessed the terrible atrocities carried out by the Nazis against the Jewish people in World War II. These awful memories remain strong in the minds of the Jewish people today. I met up with Julian Kleiner, who was born during those dark days. Julian, you've got such an incredible and interesting upbringing. Can you share with us how, as a child, that you were protected from the Nazis in Belgium? Uh, when you were born before World War II <clears throat> in a Jewish family, it looks like you always have to explain why you survived, and it's true. I was born in October 1939. Belgium was invaded in May 40. And at the end of uh, that year, or the beginning of uh, 41, like all uh, places where there were Jews uh, under Nazi occupation, uh, the authorities had to make up a list of the Jews present in their city. My city was a small town along the Belgian coast called Ostend. And in the interbellum, there were about 35, 40 Jewish families. And uh, that list exists. And I have my four grandparents on that list. I have my parents. I have myself. I would always later in life when you realize that you're a human being. When do you realize actually that you're a human being, that you have a past, that you're living in time and so on? It happens bit by bit, but maybe in puberty. And then I saw that list and what struck me is that next to my name, somebody penciled too young. And then you ask yourself, I was too young, what for? And the answer is obvious, of course. Now, um, we had, as Jews, in uh, this country, something which was um, special. When you look upon the Jewish community in those days uh, in general, we had the Belgian nationality. Most of the Jews in those days were either uh, stateless or uh, foreigners. Now, I think that because of that, uh, Belgian nationality, when the Germans started to round up Jews, we were left uh, alone. Uh, but, in, and I still got it at home, in, on the 10th of October 1942, I, uh, we received a letter from the uh, commandantur, commander from Brugge, Bruges, saying that the remaining Jews living on the Belgian coast had to uh, leave that part of the country and resettle in one of four, four cities in Belgium. Uh, my parents went to Brussels. If you would like to know why they went to Brussels, how they went to Brussels, taboo. Anyway, upon their arrival in Brussels, it must have been uh, uh, November 42, my parents went into hiding in one spot and I went into hiding with uh, Gentile. The people 
where I was hiding hmm, had a, I would say, a marital problem. Apparently, the lady met some gentleman. Her husband learned about it. And what did he do? He went to the place where my father was hiding, because my mother, and must be in spring 44, and he said to him, my wife is cheating on me. I can have my revenge by denouncing her at the Gestapo because she's hiding a Jewish child. Now you are going to pay me too, because my father was paying for me. Yeah? Otherwise, I will denounce her. So he actually went blackmailing. Uh, and luckily, you know, that's what I said, the millimeters and the seconds. Luckily, my father still had a little bit of money and he paid the gentleman as well. But Brussels was liberated in uh, September 44, so it only lasted a couple of, uh, of months. But still, you can call it people, things they cannot explain, they use semantics for it. So you can call it a miracle, luck, whatever, destiny, but what does that mean? If I'm here, it is because my father still had some money and because apparently, but I overthought it afterwards, the gentleman that, uh, gentleman that blackmailed him um, loved money more than his wife. Or maybe he said, you know, if I go to the Gestapo now and denounce my wife, they might ask, since when is the kid there? And if I say uh, a year and a half already, maybe they will ask me, well, well you're, you're, uh, uh, you're guilty as well. Who knows what went on? Anyway, I survived. Uh, my mother at the end of the war caught tuberculosis and um, she uh, went back and forth to a, a Jewish sanatorium in Switzerland, in Davos. So my mother wasn't very present and my father after the war was a broken man. Listen, I'm not lamenting. If I continue this story, it's not a tearjerker, it's a part of my life. I had a wonderful life. I had a life. I enjoyed everything in life. Good people, strange people, uh, whatever you can enjoy in life. Music, all kind of music, art. I studied. So, wonderful. But still, uh, something special happened to me, and that is that special, that I was condemned to death. Right. And, and, and that is what, something that bothers me now also. It's the second time in my life that I'm condemned to death. Because when I hear in the streets of Brussels, people shouting death to the Jews, it's me they're talking about. Strange. Huh? It's like a, a vicious circle. The beginning in my life, unaware of reality, I, I'm, I'm on that list. And now they, they condemn me to death as well. Even after the war in Ostend, in the late 40s, being Jewish, I knew there was something special with the fact that I was Jewish. And I, can I illustrate that? Absolutely. So we always went to school and came back with two, me and two other kids, so the three of us. Now, must have been 47 or 48, I don't know, I think it's 47. Going back home, all of a sudden, one of these two jump on my back and start saying about the Jews killed somebody again, I don't know what. Must have happened, something that happened in the... Uh, mandate of Palestine and uh, he was jumping on my back and I moved and he fell uh, he fell down and his head started bleeding I rushed off went home didn't say anything to my father the following day uh, I, I'm at school and he isn't there and all of a sudden the teacher and in, in, my, in my vision, the teacher was uh, next to God, huh? the Almighty. Ask um, Julien, you have to, the, uh, the, uh, the director of the school is uh, asking you to come by. The director, he was uh, Zeus, uh, not a simple God. So there I go. And there is the guy that fell down with his mother his head bandaged, 
And uh, the director asked me, did you do that? I said, yes. Why? And then in my crazy mind, if I would have told him, because he called me a dirty kike, you know what? I didn't answer. I said, I shrugged my shoulders. Because I was afraid that they would know that I was Jewish. As, as if they did know that. So I, I didn't want them to know. So somewhere, somehow, I knew there was something special with, with, with being Jewish. And then I went back to class, uh, the classroom, and the teacher gave me a zero points for behavior. I still got it in my stomach. It is still somewhere in my stomach that I received because I was afraid to tell them. Uh, and then if we look now uh, in the 21st century, again we're seeing the rise of anti-Semitism here in Belgium. Uh, can you maybe explain what is actually happening in Belgium and, and how the Jewish community is responding to this rise of anti-Semitism here? All those years uh, I've been thought of, sometimes called, a crybaby, saying, you're a pessimist. You're still, maybe because of consciously or unconsciously you went through, you have a layer of anxiety within you. And the small things that happen, well, it happens in all society, they awaken that anxiety. And when they answered me, and reacted, they answered me that way and reacted to what uh, I said, I said, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm overdoing it. Maybe I'm saying this because I want to hear their reactions to quiet me down. Not anymore. Not anymore. What actually never went away is there again. It is so deeply encroached, anti-Judaism, so deeply encroached in European society that you have to, I think, when you live outside the Jewish community, you have to strengthen yourself to force yourself not to be anti-Jewish. You can theorize on, a, on an actual, but I have a very existential question. And my very existential question is illustrated by the fact that when Jewish parents want to send their kids to Jewish schools, it's a fortress, it's barbed wire, it's police, it's soldiers. What is this? The fact that we have this conversation right now is also symptomatic. Why do we have this conversation? Because the future is looking bright ahead? I hope so. But reality is different. Would you... I, I, I would have loved to talk about uh, 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 tulip growing in Holland. I eh? know, uh, absolutely. Uh, Julian, um, do you believe that uh, the Jewish community on the whole here is in denial about the level of the terrorism threat that is posed to the Jewish community. In a sense, the people that I've interviewed here are saying, look, the, the problem that we're dealing with is terrorism uh, and it's linked to anti-Semitism, but we're being attacked, but so is the rest of Belgium society. So everything's going to that's be a new. That's a new thing. It's the whole idea of what is a democracy that me, might be under siege. And it is clear that from the moment these people, these extremists, fanatics, also attacked non-Jewish sides, that bit by bit the society at large is awakening. What the Jews think, if they're um, sticking their head into the sand, I don't think so. I don't think so. Their reaction to a situation might be different. Some of them might already be filling up their suitcases. Others uh, are just looking where their suitcases are. But there might also be Gentiles who think society is in, in, in danger here. Maybe I don't want to stay on this continent. 
how can we all play a part in confronting this evil that is anti-Semitism today? By being vigilant, by not forgetting security, and being hopeful that the future might bring the light we all need. After listening to Julian Kleiner, I went to meet Jewish leaders who are working in the government to truly understand the real and dangerous threat posed to the Jewish community of Belgium. We're here in a bookshop in uh, Brussels to meet with uh, Vivian Tatelbaum, who is the deputy of the parliament here in uh, Brussels to share her experiences of dealing with anti-Semitism as a legislator and as a leading Jewish figure in the Jewish community. Vivian, have you experienced yourself uh, any anti-Semitism um, in your official capacity as the deputy of the uh, Parliament of, of Brussels? Well, as a member of Parliament, I'm always in sort of an official capacity and unfortunately, yes, I've been victim of anti-Semitic insults, threats, uh, letters, emails, phone calls uh, over the years. Um, I've been also very, um, um, very ide identified uh, as being Jewish because I defend uh, democratic values, including uh, the fight against anti-Semitism um, and also the uh, right uh, for Israel to exist uh, as a state. And this is something that really very often leads to controversy and to uh, fights in plenary. Yeah. Uh, and what, have your, what has been the reaction of your parliamentary colleagues to you defending the Jewish people, defending Israel uh, and really standing up for the rights of the Jewish people here in Brussels? So I like to think I'm not defending the Jewish people. I like to think I'm defending democratic values. And um, the fight against anti-Semitism is part of those democratic values because a society that cannot defend its minorities or that cannot act against uh, anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, sexism, wouldn't be a democratic society. Uh, at times of increased tension in the Middle East, does it have a big impact on you? And do you personally see a rise of anti-Semitism in the uh, Brussels parliament? So every time there are tensions in the Middle East, you have the uh, tensions building in Belgium, as a matter of fact, in Europe, but in Belgium as well. And when uh, you have those tensions in the streets of Brussels, it spills off in the parliament. You have uh, demonstrations in the streets of Brussels where uh, people are uh, um, uh, having slogans like kill the Jews and uh, they have, um, uh, um, they have um, denial, uh, Holocaust denial um, things on their, on their boards and they have also Nazification of Israel, comparing Israel to the Nazis during World War II. So you have a lot of um, tensions building and um, people in the parliament uh, are uh, sometimes bringing those tensions in inside, yes. You have uh, things happening in Belgium that you would not have, think, have thought possible uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago because um, we know that anti-Semitism comes in waves. Uh, it has been ever since uh, ancient times. And sometimes the wave is so big, like during World War II and Shoah, that it takes everything on its way and destroys uh, the lives of entire communities. But sometimes the waves are smaller and uh, we still have to pay attention to it so that it doesn't become a huge wave that will take and destroy everything on its way. And I really felt that those waves were getting bigger and bigger. And as a matter of fact, uh, in the last years now, with um, people uh, killing uh, Jews on the European territory, uh, killing Jews because they are Jews on the European territory again, um, it seems that there has been a new turning point. It, it's something that uh, is very con of, concern, of, of big concern because um, those people who do that think they do that in the name of the good, in the name of the right. You see, uh, the murderers like uh, Koulibaly, Mohamed Merah, uh, Nemouche, they, they don't act and then feel sorry. They act because they think that they will do something that will be of an example. And as we could see in Europe after those attacks, those murders, um, anti-Semitic incidents have increased even more. We didn't have 
the killing of the Jews because of Jews on the European territory, but we still had a lot of anti-Semitism. Like, I could give a lot of examples, unfortunately, like this young girl who was beaten in the school, like um, there was this announcement on the train saying all Jews have to leave the train and get a sh uh, Next stop is Auschwitz, all Jews have to leave the train and get a shower when they arrive, or um, you have uh, those uh, Nazifications of Israel leading to a lot of aggressivity. You have uh, all men on a bus when they roll up their sleeves and there is a number, they would get attacks from young uh, young people from the Arabis, uh, Arab Muslim community, so they are afraid to go on the bus uh, and be again targeted as Jews. So you have a lot of incidents, those are only a few, of, a few examples. I, I will give you one example. Uh, there is this uh, old lady, a survivor of Auschwitz, in the municipality where I live. She's 99 years old, so we wanted to honor her and make an interview in the local paper and she refused because she was afraid, because she lives in a neighborhood that has a lot of people from um, uh, immigration. And uh, she's afraid that if they see her picture and they make the link between her story, her identity, and her living in that neighborhood, she will suffer attacks and threats. So if you ask me, is it possible that that would happen, Probably yes, because many people today have experienced things like that. In the, in the same municipality, we had this lady uh, who went to get some papers uh, at the administrative um, uh, part of the counters, and she, uh, her name was called. And her name was obviously a Jewish name, identified as such. And so when she left the administrative center, uh, a, a young a young man followed her and said, uh, oh, if this is your name, then you must be guilty. And he pushed her on the floor. And so there is this question coming back regularly. And people ask me, should we leave? Should we leave? So there's no good answer to that, except for me, I, of course, I will stay and fight. That's for sure. I will not leave. But many people, um, even if they won't leave, ask themselves, if they should stay, if their children should stay, what type of a future uh, can they expect for their children or grandchildren. So yes, there is a big concern in the Jewish community uh, related to those new forms of expression of anti-Semitism. Now, I have to say that I think there is, since the attacks in France of the hyper Kasher and Charlie Hebdo, I think there is uh, some kind of awakening in the political um, circles. I think people understood, one, that there, the threats against the Jewish communities are real threats. Two, that those threats are threats against the dem their democracies. And that, yes, fighting anti-Semitism means fighting to defend democratic values. The root causes are multiple. Yes, there is today a radicalization in the Arab Muslim community. And yes, there is a difficulty to uh, confront that and discuss those issues because of political correctness. But to be totally um, uh, accurate, I think we have to mention, one, Christian anti-Semitism did not disappear. It exists since uh, 2000 uh, years, and uh, we still have this expression in Belgium today. Secondly, extreme right anti-Semitism still exists. Uh, there was a, pe um, a period where it lowered after World War II, where memory protected uh, the Jewish community from that, um, and, uh, but it still exists. And its expressions are still visible today um, in the Flemish part, but also in the French part of the country. So that, dis that did not disappear. The difference between uh, the, the two forms that have been existing and the new form is that when there has been extreme right anti-Semitism, it has always been attacked uh, immediately. It was like something that we did not allow and that was condemned by all politicians immediately, an immediate reaction. With Christian anti-Semitism mostly as well, but there were, and there was never a problem in um, putting words on that type of, uh, of anti-Semitism. Now, the, the, the Arab Muslim anti-Semitism is something that's much more difficult for politicians to condemn, obviously. And also the extreme left 
anti-Semitism that uh, is uh, visible uh, for quite some years now and that is um, sometimes in link with the Arab Muslim anti-Semitism. And this one is linked to two facts. First, the import of the conflict of the Middle East. Secondly, the radicalizations of those communities. And the radicalization of that com those communities leads to a much more open anti-Semitism with all the red lines that have been crossed and all the vocabulary that has come back and many people not reacting, unfortunately. Some do, some do, but many don't. And uh, therefore, the, the problem is growing, but it's not only anti-Semitism that's being expressed in those communities, it's a direct attack on women's rights, uh, it's an attack on uh, homosexuals, uh, it's the whole uh, uh, progressive aspects of our societies that have been developing over the years and that has led to a very democratic uh, and tolerant society that's being under fire by this radicalization and anti-Semitism is one of those components. Uh, Vivian, I'd, I would agree with you, everything that you've said there, particularly with the rise of far-right traditional mm -hmm. anti-Semitism, attitudes within, within the church towards the Jewish people, but the difference and also with the left and the way that they are attacking Israel and, it's, and they're using this as a cloak of anti-Zionism as to mask their anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. But the difference between that type of anti-Semitism and the anti-Semitism that is coming from the Islamic community is that they don't use violence. So the difference between the two really is that it's because of the jihadic nature of this anti-Semitism and the way that they target the Jewish people, this makes this a more dangerous threat to deal with now than say the other forms of anti-Semitism. I'm not saying they're not a problem, but I'm saying in terms of violence and threats, this is surely the more pressing issue to deal with. Yes, physical violence, yes, yes, uh, yes uh, absolutely. Uh, and that's what has changed since 2012 and the uh, attack in Toulouse on the school and um, on the military. I think this has been the uh, launch of this new form of anti-Semitic violence that really targets Jews and kills Jews because they are Jews. And also you have those uh, very violent uh, demonstrations in the streets of many cities of Europe, maybe Paris, Brussels, uh, Amsterdam, but many other cities as well, uh, where it sometimes lead to a chase of Jews in the streets, uh, attacks like in Paris, on synagogues and people having to barricade themselves inside and, and stuff like that. Yes, I, I agree. I think that since those since this expression has burst out, um, it has really been a turning point where uh, Jews have started to feel insecure and asking themselves the question, what is our future here? Because, because reactions have not been what they had to be. The political answer to those violences has not been at the time something that was really to be considered uh, enough. I mean, you had uh, political leaders, members of parliaments, mayors, ministers that were in the demonstrations and when they started yelling kill the Jews, they did not leave the demonstration. And afterwards, because maybe they didn't know, you can think, maybe they didn't know, I mean, I'm willing to go that far, but then afterwards they did not condemn what has happened and say, I'm sorry, I stayed there because I didn't realize what was happening. I didn't hear, I didn't see. It was in Arabic, I couldn't read uh, the, the billboards that were, you know. But then after that, nothing happened. On the contrary, you, you continue to have a political um, statements supporting only a one side support of the Palestinian people. You need good legislation then you need politicians who make clear statements, then you need a press that informs, and that can lead to a change of mentality, and that can lead to something that will probably reverse the feeling that Jews have today, and that is this feeling of um, unease and asking themselves, questioning their future in Europe. The more I learn about the challenges facing the Jewish community in Belgium, it becomes more apparent that this is affecting every aspect of Jewish life. 
it seems that even Jewish children and students are not immune from the rise of Jew hatred. As these young people progress through education and go on to university, this is where many of them experience verbal and physical abuse just for being Jewish. So how many uh, Jewish students do you represent here in Belgium? Oh, there are approximately 500 students uh, in the organization, and I estimate that there are 800 uh, Jewish students uh, all over the country. And uh, what would you say is the biggest challenge facing uh, Jewish students in universities today across Belgium? The biggest challenge is to fight against the prejudices, and uh, because um, there are organizations that um, propagate uh, some uh, prejudices about the Jews, like you are Zionists, you support uh, the crimes against children, you support the uh, thieves of land. So they, th we, we have to fight against those prejudices. Uh, I have an example. Uh, there, there was a, a gathering organized by BDS, an organization uh, promoting the boycott, and they put a, a wall uh, in, on the main street of the university during the, the lunchtime. And the, the students so went to, to lunch and they went also to study in the library. And when, when they recognized some Jews, they, they put their finger so publicly and they said, oh, those are the students uh, of the uh, Union of Jewish Students of Belgium. This wall is f dedicated to you. So you are responsible of what's happening in uh, Israel and Palestine. And those Jews never expressed uh, an opinion and they were accused of something <laughs> happening 3,000 uh, 3, kilometers from Belgium. And so I, I gave the instruction to not answer to those accusations and to take their phones and to film, to show to, to the citizens what's happening in the universities. And they did so. So they, they, they made a, a short film, we put it on internet uh, to, to, to show the reality. And so they said, no, it's not against the Jews, it's because they are Zionists, they support the politics of Israel. Like I said, they, they support crimes against children, they, they support genocide. So it's <laughs> it, it was this type of accusation to legitimate anti-Semitism in the universities. It's the main challenge today in the universities is to fight against this, to fight against this new anti-Semitism. And like I, like I say, it's the anti-Semitism 3.0, the, the third version of anti-Semitism. The first one was the religious anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism. The second was, was the anti-Semitism based uh, against uh, the appartenance to the Jewish community. And the third one is the anti-Semitism uh, of the, uh, the 21th century. The anti-Semitism from, uh, from uh, and Jews can expect, expect from it, but they have to say that they are anti-Zionist, that they join the cause against Israel and against the Jewish community. They have to, to become the, um, the, they, they, the hater of their community. And for the, for the Jews, it's the same, like, like the anti-Semitism 1.0 and 2.0. There is no difference. So who, who is perpetuating this uh, anti-Semitism and uh, anti-Semitic attitudes against uh, Jewish students? So there are two groups, two big groups. The first one is the extreme left, well organized, uh, with money. And the second one is the Arabic circles in, uh, in Belgium. And there, there is an alliance in the universities and they organize together these type of events. And um, when it comes down to anti-Semitism, have you personally experienced any anti-Semitic attacks or can you share some sort of stories of, of anti-Semitism that Jewish students have experienced here in Brussels? Simply, like every Jew in the university, I think, when somebody say, you think that's, you think it's, so, somebody give you an opinion you never expressed. Just because you are, you are, you, you are from a community, you are thinking like it. Like it. So this anti-Semitism is to, 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 to give an opinion to a group. So this group, and there is a comparison uh, of this group with the Nazis. So the Jew, the, the Jewish, the Israel is the Nazis of today, and the Jewish community are the collaborators all over the world. And the Palestinians are the victims of today for them. And so, you, it's in the, in, the, in, the, in the life of every day. You are, for them, 
a, a person uh, responsible of a genocide uh, and they, pu they put the finger uh, in the public place uh, against you to accuse you. It's extremely violent. So it's not physical violence, but it's in the speech. And like in this way, you, it's much more difficult to have a discussion uh, and to, to share the Jewish culture because there is an, uh, a feeling of rejection uh, against the Jewish community. Like we don't want to speak with the Nazis, we don't want to speak with the South African uh, apartheid regime and they don't want to speak with Jews because there are lots of prejudices. Are there students who no longer want to go to university because of the experience of anti-Semitism that they've actually faced? Yes, the, the students speak, so they speak to their, uh, to their parents, they speak to their little brothers, little sisters, and so we, we observe a phenomenon that the, the, the young uh, students are leaving before their studies, uh, they're leaving to England, to Canada, to the United States, and also to Israel. We have less and less uh, students, Jewish students in Belgium today. What would you like to see take place in order to protect um, Jewish students at university, but also to ensure that Jewish students don't face any anti-Semitism or discrimination? A lot of persons don't understand the anti-Semitism 3.0 because they don't use the term Jew. They, they use another term, Zionist. And for certain persons, it's a op political opinion. And we have to show that it's not a political opinion. We, uh, alone, we cannot success. We have to, to find the support of uh, the other citizen to, 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 to succeed. We have arranged to meet uh, Julien, who is a university student, who can tell us at uh, first hand the experience he's faced of anti-Semitism. Julien, can you explain to us um, how, as a Jewish student, that you've personally experienced uh, anti-Semitism. One day people uh, come to me and uh, play with the lighter on my jacket to make it burn because I was Jewish and uh, they say um, something like uh, go burn with your ancestors uh, in a oven, go, go back, uh, go die because you're Jewish and I went to the, the director of the school, I asked him uh, what to do and he, he asked to, to the student who say uh, this, wo this word um, and asked him to apologize to me. And the student said, I'm really sorry that you are a friend of something normal. For him, it was normal to try to burn me and uh, to say that. And the, the director said, OK, uh, do you accept this apologies? And I said, no. This is not uh, some. Uh, uh, this is uh, not apologies. It's uh, something worse for me. He said, "Okay, I, I can do anything. He's he free to go." How can we ensure that uh, students like yourself don't experience uh, anti-Semitism at uh, universities and schools? In university, I don't really know. Maybe teach to the teacher what the reality is. Maybe if the teacher knows what the reality is, they can uh, teach to the student what it is. On the 24th of May 2014, Mehdi Mamouche, a 29-year-old French national from Algerian origin, entered the Jewish Museum in downtown Brussels with a handgun and a Kalashnikov rifle. He opened fire on Jewish civilians, killing three and critically wounding a fourth who later died in hospital. The attacker had not long returned from Syria after fighting for the Islamic State. It is believed that his radical Islamic beliefs led him to single out a Jewish target. Behind me is the uh, Jewish Museum that was um, attacked on the 24th of May 2014, which killed four Jewish people. I regularly come to Brussels once a month. And the one thing I've noticed after the Paris attack is that we see paratroopers guarding Jewish places of interest. And as you can see behind me, there are two Belgium paratroopers who are protecting this Jewish museum. And sadly, all I can say is that this is a sad reflection of Belgium society. The fact that the imminent threat of the Islamic State and Islamic fundamentalists is so real that we're now seeing 
Belgian paratroopers with machine guns protecting a Jewish museum. Who could have thought this could have happened, particularly now in the uh, 2015? We're in the Grand Central Synagogue of Europe in Brussels for a memorial service for the victims of the Jewish Museum terror attack. Those four people were members of our family, very close members, and uh, we feel that every, every year, every day, every day, we feel how much we miss them. Very much indeed. What is the uh, moral lesson that we can all learn from this? The lesson, the lesson, we have got the lesson, but the lesson is for everybody in the streets. Life has changed. Life has changed. It has, you know, when it started in Toulouse two years ago, everybody said this is a typical Jewish uh, attentat. And then came Brussels. And after Brussels, I thought, it's not only the Jewish who are under the fire. It's our culture. It's a way of life of everybody on the street. And after Paris, and after the Bardot, and after Mosul, we feel that we are living something very different. It's really our democracy. It's really our life together who is in danger. And as I said in the piece, in my speech, all the authorities everywhere in Europe, they feel that the the danger is very, very different. It's, it's, an, it's a war, but it's a different war. It's a war and everybody is involved. You see what is happening in uh, the Christian, in Orient. You see what is happening with the Ethiopian. You see what is happening with the Copt. You see what is happening for different Muslim. We are in a war where the enemy can be in our wall and we don't know it. So our authorities have got a terrible job, terrible job, not easy. With this new wave of terrorism targeting the Jewish community, it's not surprising that people are afraid to be visibly identified as Jewish. We're now joined by Serge uh, Rosen, who is the president of the CCOJB here in Brussels. Well, what is life like now for, um, say, an Orthodox uh, Jew who's recognised as being Jewish by wearing the kippah or, or wearing the uh, taglit, the uh, prayer shawl, um, and they can be identified also by maybe wearing the uh, Star of David or the Magim David. Um, are there areas in Belgium that as someone who's um, seen visibly as a Jewish person would be afraid to go? Yes, I think that's uh, certainly the case. Uh, we don't need to hide ourselves. That's the case in, in some areas, par primarily in Brussels. Um, and maybe strangely enough, not that much in Antwerp or at least uh, not to my knowledge, but Brussels is a case where I've heard many people saying that you don't wear a kippah in the street, you don't wear a kippah in the public transport, you don't show uh, visibly a David Star in the public transport. That's indeed uh, the situation. The uh, immigration of the Muslim f coming from uh, uh, North Africa and Middle East, but mostly North Africa, um, has been a complete failure, a complete failure. Uh, we've left those communities under the influence of uh, their own country. People uh, who are not, uh, uh, if you want, uh, uh, screened uh, by the Belgian authorities. And uh, I think we see the result now, yes. And uh, what's it going to take um, for the authorities in Belgium, the security forces, the government, to reassure the Jewish community 
and also to confront this rise of anti-Semitism that first attacks the Jewish people and then it engulfs the rest of uh, Belgium and European society. I think I mentioned one, it's the, the visible security forces uh, which is uh, already in place. I think uh, there's also a project to um, um, uh, allocate public funds to improve the security of Jewish buildings through, you know, uh, safety SAS and, and uh, safety, uh, security cameras and things like that. Um, that will also be... Uh, um, but also, uh, I think, the, the state or the law or the, the, the tribulants need to be much um, more s stringent and strict on applying the laws against anti-Semitic, maybe more generally racist, but anti-Semitic acts, which are much too often just neglected and, and not uh, pursued in a legal sense. So that's certainly something, more st strict appliance of the laws. And then using the schools again to for an education program uh, which brings together the values that all the people need to have in this country. Uh, and, and finally, Serge, uh, you're president of the CCOJB. What legacy would you like to leave behind for the uh, Jewish community? But the legacy I would like to uh, leave is, first of all, some success uh, in, in visible measures to protect the Jewish community and give her the sense that, yes, there is a future. And I think it's not only uh, action that we need to get from, from the outside world and from the public authorities. I think there is also something we need to do ourselves. Uh, there are within the Muslim world a lot of moderate people whose ambition is to live peacefully in Belgium. As Belgians, we need to build bridges with them. Uh, and work together to a better future. I think we also need to look at ourselves and see what can we do uh, um, to improve uh, our future in, in, in Belgium. Uh, and then uh, a side one, maybe not that important, but still a bit hard, um, dear to my heart, is bringing more unity to the Jewish community, um, which I think is important in an, in an environment of uh, a difficult environment as we have now. Uh, Serge, thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview today and, and from this interview I'm, I'm pretty much sure that the uh, Jewish community here in Belgium is in very safe hands under your leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our European leaders need to stop hiding behind political correctness and confront the rise of extremist Islam, otherwise we face a more dangerous and uncertain future. It is time that our leaders made some difficult and painful decisions to put policies into place that will prevent the rise of Islamic fundamentalism in Europe and thus ensure that we protect our future and secure our cherished values of freedom and democracy for our children and our children's children. Our last interview takes us to the National Parliament of Belgium. Uh, Senator Jack, you are an elder statesman of uh, the Jewish community here in, uh, in, in Belgium. And when we see young Jewish people, children, afraid to go to school because of uh, anti-Semitic instances, I think it's now only a third of uh, Jewish children actually go to state schools here in Belgium because of anti-Semitism. And uh, students at university um, who feel that their Jewish identity is under threat because of their association and passion um, with Israel and solidarity with Israel, with the Jewish state. Um, and many of them are fearful that they are now going to different universities um, abroad in the United States or in Israel. And knowing that the young people are tomorrow's future, is there a future for the Jewish community here in Belgium when so many young Jewish people no longer feel safe here? I think there is a future without, without any hesitation. Personally, I think, uh, because very often the question has been asked to me, I am Belgium citizen, I am Jew, everybody knows I am Jew, very clear, and I'm not afraid. And uh, I shall live here. I shall not leave Belgium to to go anywhere else. 
I feel well here and uh, I'm very relaxed. But for the future, we have to change. We have to change education. We have to bring in the school the history of religions to let children and, of course, teenagers and so on, the future generation, understanding that we can, you and me, we have not the same religion, but we respect each other. You will not cut my head and I shall not cut yours. But this is the history, your family history, my family history. We wish to keep our tradition. We have not to, to forget from where we are coming, but we have to respect each other and accept that some people may have another religion, another tradition. The solution is not to keep the army in the street. Two soldiers will never protect a school, will never protect a synagogue or a museum. But due to that, I think uh, some people, especially those who have young children, may be anxious, saying, I bring my children in a school and now the school is protected. But it is for a period of time. It's not forever. Today, due to the media, due to internet, uh, there, there is a pollution of the mind, of the brain, of unfortunately many young Muslim people. And also because when they go to the mosque, they receive message of aggressivity and not message of tolerance and no message we have to live together, all together with respect of each other. So due to that, I know that today in uh, many, I would say, many cities, not, only, not in Belgium, it's the same everywhere in the world, few Jews will go in the street with any external signs of their belonging to Jewish people. In the past, it was normal. Today, even they wear it, they could be robbed or be having aggressivity. But it is also due to the fact that we are living in a more aggressive civilization. When you see what happened today in Africa, in Africa, in Nigeria, with Boko Haram, that's not anti-Semitism. But we are living in a world with much aggressivity. And of course, Jews are on the first line, for many reasons. But not only Jews. Look what happened to, to Yezidi, to uh, many Christian population in Iraq and Syria today, against what happened in some part of Africa today. Uh, no, uh, I think uh, the world is changing. And uh, for the future, really, I don't know exactly how we could stop it. I can think, what can we do here in Belgium, and maybe the same in France, Holland, Germany, England, so on, because we are living together. I think we have to invest on education, messages, but we need having the help of the media for that. And media are very powerful, TV, newspaper, and of course we need having, would say, more control on everything which is given through internet. On that we need laws which are more severe than today. And um, finally, Senator Jack, do you, do you have a message um, for Christians in, in particular who, who love the Jewish people, who love Israel, who want to fight and contend for the truth of Israel's righteous cause, that Israel is not the problem in the Middle East, Israel 
is the solution to the problems in the Middle East um, and that how can they support the Jewish community more, particularly in Europe? I think that uh, first of all, uh, if uh, we trust in something, in somebody, we can name it God. It's not the same God, but it's a God. It's not the God of violence. So I think that it's very important that Israel has support from outside and not only from Jewish community. And very important that Israel and Jewish people have the support because how many Jews have you in the world? A few millions. How many Jews have we in Belgium? 30,000. That's nothing. So we need support from outside. 30,000 Jews in Belgium, 11 million of inhabitants. If we stay alone, it will be difficult to survive in a world of violence. So we need the help of Christian uh, people and we need the help of all the people who are, I would say, open-minded people who may accept that uh, we have to, to help each other. And I come back to my example as a doctor. I have never asked to anybody, what is your religion? What is your political opinion? From which country are you coming? Never. You came to me because you had a brain tumor. I did the surgery the best I could. And the same for everybody. Because my wish was to save life and not to kill people. And that we have to do it together. Reflecting on the time I've spent here in Belgium, uh, meeting with leaders of the Jewish community, looking at the rise of anti-Semitism and how it's affecting the Jewish community here in Brussels and in Europe. Uh, the only conclusion that I can possibly come to in how to deal and confront anti-Semitism is not the answer I believe the Jewish community want to hear. And the answer is Aliyah to, to, to Israel. And only in Israel will Jews feel really safe. The consequences for European society of having their Jewish populations leave is one that's too frightening to even comprehend because this will mean a loss of culture, a loss of business, a loss of enterprise, a loss of cultural expression within art, within sport, within politics, and that Europe will be devolved of its heart and its soul. And this is something that Sadly, if our legislators, like the European Parliament behind us, our national European governments, the European Commission and the European Union don't tackle this issue of anti-Semitism, then this sadly will become a reality in the years to come. On the last leg of our journey, we travelled to Jerusalem to attend the Global Forum for Combating Antisemitism to find out what the Israeli government is doing to confront this growing problem of Jew hatred around the world. Mm -hmm.